Club. Thank you very much, Mike, um, and hopefully you can all hear me. Um, thank you very much for coming to the session at the end of the day. I know it's now starting to be a longer day. I'm Nina O'Hare. I'm the secretary of the Voluntary and Community SIG, um, and I'm also a community project officer for Worcestershire Archive and Archaeology Service. So I'm going to kick off this afternoon's session with a look at insights from um, a survey we had out um, to local planning authority archaeologists about community engagement. The survey report for this will be out shortly, so I'm not going to go through it question by question and bore you with kind of lots of numbers and percentages for things, um, but I'm going to look at the broader picture um, and some of the key considerations that it's raised. So hopefully this will help us to move the conversation on a little bit from why we should be doing community engagement, which I think a lot of us have either signed up for already or know a lot of the arguments behind, um, but to looking at actually how do we embed this strand um, of public benefits and maximise um, the kind of the amount of it that's happening um, and the public benefits that are generated through this kind of strand. So as a brief overview, um, we carried out the survey um, in winter 2020-2021. The survey was put together by the special interest group um, with some support from um, Dr. Sadie Watson's UKRI funded project. If you haven't come across it already, um, it's on looking at maximizing and measuring the benefit um, that archaeology generates in infrastructure-led projects. Um, we were supported by CIFA and Algeo in actually circulating the survey. And we had a particular focus on understanding what the status quo is. So what community engagement is already happening in development projects. Um, and particularly we wanted to look at the everyday projects. So not the HS2 size, the very exceptional projects, um, but actually on evaluations and smaller excavations that make up the kind of a lot of the day-to-day -day work for most commercial archaeologists. Um, so that was kind of a focus for it, and we wanted to have a look as well at whether people are, local planning authorities are requiring this of projects, or if they're requesting it and kind of asking nicely for it to happen. Um, and also some of the barriers um, that are in the way to stopping it be a more routine part of these everyday commercial projects. So we had 52 responses to the survey from across England, Scotland and Wales, um, and those 52 respondents represent a, no a few more local authorities. This is quite a few people who covered multiple areas. So the insights fall into three categories, really, and so I'll go through each of these um, in turn. Um, the first one being um, about the perception of community engagement, how people perceive it the barriers to getting it implemented more often, and um, the need for sector-wide resources was something that also very strongly came out of the survey. So the first point, which um, as a community archaeologist myself was a, perhaps a slightly surprising one, um, but there seems to be a common perception um, among those who responded to our survey um, that community engagement is seen to be expensive, that it has to involve, or almost always has to involve, access to the excavation fieldwork site itself, that it has to be done during that fieldwork stage. It's generally something that's done to a community, presented to them rather than working with them, and that it's generally thought to not be wanted by developers. Um, and it was quite striking that this came out of the survey um, and was kind of the predominant view of what community engagement means. I should stress as well that this wasn't all respondents, not everyone held this view, um, but it seemed to be the predominant view of this is when we asked people about community engagement, this is kind of the go-to image of what, what people think it means. So it seemed quite clear that actually, I think community engagement has a bit of an image problem because actually, Community engagement can mean public open days on site, having volunteers involved in an excavation, putting up information boards. But it doesn't have to be those things. It can be something totally virtual, um, online talks, virtual tours, social media posts. 
It could involve something as simple as having a whiteboard on the fencing around the site that gets updated every so often. It could be a handling session with a local school or a local community group. Community engagement can be <laughs> low cost, can be virtual. It doesn't have to happen during the fieldwork stage. It could happen during post-excavation. If a site's confidential, it could even happen afterwards, um, year down the line, once that site is no longer confidential. Um, there are benefits to developers as well as communities, and I think that's something that we don't recognize enough. Developers can get something out of doing this as well. It's not purely altruistic all the time. Um, and it can also be a two-way process, which is often when it works the best. Um, the community engagement involves talking to those communities and learning from them, and from them shaping what, what they feel kind of is most needed and would most benefit them as well. So there's a general sense from the survey um, that local planning authorities want to see more community engagement happening in the commercial projects that they see coming through, but that there's a series of barriers in the way that stop it from being a more routine part. So these barriers were kind of broadly grouped into, firstly, knowledge of community engagement. So some of that is around uncertainty about what community engagement options are out there, actually just being able to know what ideas um, you could have during a project and what might be best for that particular project, given the location and the audience and the archaeology that's expected there. It's not just that, though, and local planning authority archaeologists are, on the whole, not specialists in community engagement. I mean, we wouldn't expect them to be. But that uncertainty about community engagement, I think, also creates some perceived barriers. That quite traditional view of community engagement that we've kind of been through on the last few sli slides, it does mean that sometimes there's the perception, which might not be the reality, but there's still the perception that if you think you need access to site and the health and safety, the logistics of that are tricky, um, or you think the ideas are all going to be very expensive and it's a project with a very tight budget or it's confidential during the planning stages, that those perceived barriers um, can stop community engagement from happening. The second um, strand that came out of the survey was this idea of proportionality. Um, community engagement isn't a sort of um, one size fits all, something that you pick up and the same thing happens on every project. Um, there's lots of different ways of carrying out community engagement um, and while an extensive program of community engagement might be appropriate for some sites, such as a city centre excavation, it's going to have high footfall, lots of interest, highly significant archaeology. Actually, if you've got a smaller excavation with archaeology, that say of kind of local significance, that same amount of community engagement isn't proportionate to the rest of the project. So if we start thinking about community engagement as being proportionate to the project, what's reasonable to expect to happen, someone has to start making a decision about what's proportionate um, and how significant that project is. Um, so that was something that started to come up, that people have come across this and actually as a sector, this isn't something we've looked at and decided on. So hopefully during the discussion, we'll have a bit of a chance to kind of start exploring this a little bit more. And then the last two points, um, I'm going to cover in a little bit more detail, um, but they're about the idea of whether we can actually require community engagement to be part of projects. Um, and if we go down more of the persuasion route, how do you actually convince developers um, that this is something to do? So first off, can we actually require community engagement to happen as part of a project uh, kind of through the planning system? We currently as a sector don't have any kind of overarching guidelines or systems in place for doing this. Nevertheless, um, we found through the survey that of respondents, 60% of local authorities who had surveyed were occasionally requiring community engagement as part of a developer-funded project, which is an encouraging amount. It's happening in a reasonable amount of cases. 
um, and 30% regularly require it. So local planning authorities are clearly starting to make decisions about when and where community engagement should be happening. Um, but those deci decisions are all going to be slightly different. Understandably, um, everyone's making their own decision. In some local authorities, that's happening in more cases than in perhaps the neighboring county. We also had some respondents um, in the questions around kind of this point. Um, they said that they felt that through the national planning policy framework, it's not possible at the moment um, to require community engagement. Um, and that was a difference that, of kind of opinion that came up. Some people felt that it's possible through the planning framework to require it, um, include it in the wording as part of a planning condition or request that it's built into a WSI. Some local authorities felt that um, the wording in MPPF is not quite strong enough and that you can't require a developer to include it in a commercial archaeology project. You can only ask them to. So this is something that clearly needs looking at in more detail. Um, but kind of what it all boils down to is that what we currently have going on is this sort of slightly ad hoc model of um, opting in to community engagement. So for some projects, under certain circumstances, it's felt that community engagement should be happening, but it's not routinely being considered unless certain criteria, which kind of vary by local authority, is met. We also asked during the survey um, whether respondents have come across successful ways to get community engagement included as part of a developer-led project. The general theme that came out of these was the carrot, not stick approach um, of actually showing the benefits that developers can get out of it, the increased publicity, um, links, increased links with the local community, meeting their social responsibility requirements. I mean, it's that side that we should be focusing on. And there was also um, an emphasis on starting discussions as early as possible, um, particularly in the pre-planning, pre-application stage of the planning process. However, there obviously are some kind of inherent barriers there in that sort of persuasion approach. Um, first one being you need a developer to be amenable, to be willing to listen to that in the first place. And it also requires local planning authorities to have the case studies and that persuasive sort of reasoning and arguments to present to developers and to clients. And that's something that um, we don't have very coherently within archaeology at the moment. I'm sure a lot of you either know personally or have come across case studies, um, particularly where there have been benefits to developers. Um, I know I've heard in previous talks about um, whole housing estates where they've sold faster than average because of the increased publicity due to community archaeology and com engagement with the local communities. But they never seem to get written down <laughs> and we need to start doing this more so that we have those to share. So, and um, the last one, which again was quite striking, is we have a very pessimistic view <laughs> of um, what developers think of the public benefits that archaeology can generate for them. So rightly or wrongly, um, it gen was generally felt amongst the respondents um, that developers either don't know that archaeology could help them generate public benefits, meet their social responsibility requirements, or they don't care about it. So whether or not there's perceived barriers or actual barriers in the way, um, there's still quite significant uh, hurdles that as a sector we need to be addressing if we want to maximise the amount of public benefits that can be generated, and particularly through community engagement. So bearing all this in mind, um, we want to have a look at how do we actually move the sector forward. So that was perhaps some of the kind of gloom side, the things that are getting in the way. Um, but there are things that we can be doing and, and start thinking about to actually kind of move us forward and to have community engagement a more routine part of developer-led projects. First one is skills, um, skills development and training. So that's not just having more community archaeologists or more of those skills amongst kind of a wider pool 
of people within the sector. Um, but it's also, I think, some training and information out there to start changing that image problem that community engagement has. It doesn't have to be that super expensive on-site um, kind of idea that, that traditionally, I think, comes across. The second thing that would be really helpful is a proper range of case studies. There's been lots, particularly over, during CIFA conferences, um, of case studies where community engagement has worked really well. Um, what we need to make sure is when we collect these case studies that they are a range of projects, particularly a range of sizes. There is a bit of a tendency to, um, for community engagement to happen in the very large, high profile, um, in significant archaeology kind of projects. Excavations that happen for a lot, really long time. We need to be looking as well, particularly at the smaller projects, small excavations, large valuations, projects of that size that are sort of more the everyday um, sort of ones that we come across. We also need to start recording uh, much more systematically um, and so that we can share it, the benefits that developers get from community engagement. Um, that purely altruistic uh, view that, you know, we just need to convince developers that, you know, community engagement is good to do because it's good for society. We don't have to go down that route. Um, there are benefits that developers can get out of it. We just need to be recording those better so that we can, we can present them back to clients. Um, and hopefully we can put all this together and I would suggest that um, you know, at some point in the future, it'd be good to start working towards an opt-out model of community engagement rather than the current opt-in one. We really should be thinking about commercial archaeology projects as including some element of community engagement that is proportionate to the project, and they opt out if for some reason that is not appropriate, whereas at the moment we have they opt in if they're deemed significant enough. And the last point um, is that the survey showed quite strong support for some standards and guidance. Um, we need something as a sector that can start tackling some of these kind of thornier questions and setting out approaches to if we can at all be requiring community engagement through the planning system and how we can go about doing that, um, as well as looking at what is proportional um, to projects and also how it can be delivered in a high quality way rather than just going, oh, there's some community engagement that's happened that we know it's kind of the maximum public benefit has been generated from it. So hopefully this has given you all some kind of interesting food for thought. We've got a video now um, which Jessica's going to introduce and then we'll move on to the discussion. So um, please kind of, yeah, get your thoughts and questions ready for that.